Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Sunday, February 9th, 2020, and I have with me today author and researcher Von Gault for a second time around, and <laughs> let's see if we can make it work this time. Okay, <laughs> so uh, there you are. Hi, Von. How you doing? Hi. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Let's try this again and see what we can do here. All right, so as I said, you know, I gave the introductory on my channel, so a lot of people know about you and who you are, so I'm just going to let you talk now and tell us all about yourself and why you got into this whole thing. Yeah, well, again, Dave, thank you so much for the, the you know, interviewing me on your show, helping me with the project, and um, just really excited and, and to get this information out. So, and kind of get this book, the research done on this book so that I can finally write this book. I've been so interested in writing for over 10 years. So um, again, I'm Von Gault. Um, I'm just a normal working mom here in the Seattle area. And I write books as a kind of a hobby passion of mine on things that I'm interested in. And one of the things I'm very interested in is um, megaliths and pyramids. Um, but however, what brought me into this subject of tribal folklores actually was inspired not from my childhood fascination of ancient archaeology, um, but I almost went to the University of Arizona to get an archaeology degree, which I didn't, and I'm getting a business degree and going into IT, but still have a fascination and love for um, really, really ancient um, archaeology. But what brought me into this topic of tribal folklores. Um, so um, I'm Laotian. I have been raised Laotian with Laotian folklore and Buddhist folklore for 40 years. So I'm very familiar um, with the material. And my mother um, throughout my life helped sponsor build an artwork um, and construction on Buddhist monasteries throughout Northern Laos. Mm -hmm. So um, I got the chance to, you know, find the time out of work to go with her and see one of the Buddhist monasteries in Northern Laos um, in Champasse um, district of where my parents village was. So I went there and I took a look at um, the, uh, the Buddhist monastery that was recently um, renovated with new artwork that my mother's helped sponsor the build of. And I was walking around and I was taking a look at it and I'm like, hmm, I find some very interesting things here. And one of the things that I um, found that was interesting was I found that in the artwork, there was a lot of mega flood artwork and the people of the monastery um, said that the flood is estimated to be over 10,000 years ago. So a lot of the flood artwork is over 10,000 years ago, but they don't know exactly the exact dates. They just know it's over 10,000 years and that might be short in the estimation of time. But the reason why artwork in these monasteries are so important to the culture of Northern Laos is because much of the, the people in the area are illiterate. And the way that they keep their, their history alive is through telling stories from generation to generation. And they're, called, they're just oral stories of their history and what their people um, and the area had gone through. And they just keep telling it over and over and over again. And um, these folklores have been wrapped into Buddhist folklores because even though Buddhism has come into the area um, over almost 2,600 years ago, um, the history and the oral history gets again wrapped into the Buddhist um, artwork as well to document the history of the people in that area. So a lot of Southeast Asian um, Buddhist monasteries have Buddhist artwork along with Buddhist mythology and Southeast Asian mythology in their monasteries to document the oral history that's told from generation to generation. 
And so, you know, when you tell a story after many, many thousands of years, it starts becoming myth and folklore. But to the people in the area, um, that's their history that they've been telling over and over again. So we have to make that distinction that indigenous cultures believe that these oral stories are their history. So by telling them they are, by telling them and having the next generation remember them and tell it to the next generation, that's how they keep these stories of their history alive because the people are illiterate. Yeah. So that's why it's so important when you go into these monasteries that you see artwork. The minute you step into the monasteries and you go all over the monasteries, there's artwork everywhere because that's how they document is by telling uh, their story through pictures to an illiterate um you know, because society. So, so when I went there, I, I saw the mega flood artwork and I was like, well, that's interesting. And I saw a lot of artwork about ancient technology, levitation technology, um, you know, flying chariots, all these kind of things, you know, kind of very uh, advanced high tech artwork, but um, in kind of a um, ancient style. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I, I sent you the picture of um, one of the mega flood artwork in the I Buddhist did. temple. I was just showing it. I was oh, just you showing already? it. Yeah, you see the deity in the air. He's carrying somebody. It looks like another deity. Mm -hmm. And there's people in the water getting eaten by alligators and sharks and stuff. It looks pretty horrible. And yeah. There's so a the boat in the background. It looks like a junk type boat in mm -hmm. the background. So that's that that is a very common um, depiction of the mega flood um, that the folklore that has been wrapped into Buddhist artwork and literature in the area. I see. Basically, the, the folklore goes is that over way over 10,000 years ago, there was this mega flood that came through and the flood came through and it the people who survived were the ones who headed to the mountains, um, such as Tibet, such as the tops of, um, you know, like Hawaii, the tops of the Polynesian islands, the top of, of all these different islands that are now. According to the Buddhist folklore in these monasteries, the flood came through and the people who survived headed up to the mountaintops. Also, the people who um, were were who had a connection to the other side somehow they got tipped off to get the possessions and the things that they needed to survive and put it into boats right. so so many of the people not just one boat but many boats mm. so there are many boats all around asia the pacific islands according to the buddhist folklore of these people making these huge boats for their families and people um, that was going to be with them, their seafaring people, with their possessions because they were expecting this huge flood to come through because some, for some reason they had gotten this insight. Everybody else who didn't get this insight for some reason obviously got ravaged by the flood. And so the folklore that, that is familiar. Yeah, the folklore that's documented in these Buddhist monasteries that go back more than 10,000 years ago are all over Southeast Asia, completely independent of any colonization. I see. Okay, that's the folklore, because I talk about folklore. Right. So I saw that, I'm like, hmm, that's very interesting. And so then I go into um, further into my trip in Laos and I see the plain of jars. And the plane of jars, if you if you show that those pictures, Dave, the plane of jars are these, there's hundreds of megalithic jars that are like 15, 20, or even sometimes 30 feet tall, megalithic jars, That's hundreds crazy. scattered in disarray. Some even have lids still on them. Right. Some have lids fallen off, just in disarray all across the valleys of North Laos. Um, maybe about 15, 20 minute drive from the village that my parents grew up in. Right. Not far from there. Far. And so, and so, you know, there was a, maybe an amateur archaeologist um, who came through and said, because she found um, a couple of um, bones in a couple of these jars, she made a blanket statement that these were all funerary 
jars. Right. And that could be true for a couple of those jars, but there are hundreds of these all across the valley there. Right. And the folklore, according to um, Laotians, is that this is the remnant of a huge drinking party um, in northern Laos of giants. At one time, according to folklore, we had existed and lived amongst these giants who would um, make these megalithic um, structures, many of one, one of which are these jars, mm -hmm. and they had a war and they decided to celebrate winning that war in this area. And this was basically like the remnants of a big Super Bowl party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, it's uh, leftover Budweiser's from the, from the giant Super Bowl party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you, if you show that, and then I think I've sent you a couple pictures of um, different ones of with kids playing on top of one of the lids yeah. popped open. Um, there's a woman standing next one, just so you can see how huge these are. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like you have these, um, these short Laotians moving around these like life-size jars, <laughs> hundreds of them, and then just kind of spilling them everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's the folklore of the plain of jars. So um, it's a really great tourism spot. So then I saw that I'm like, hmm, that's that's interesting as well. Um, and then I went home and I had taken a, a DNA ancestry test on my DNA because I was very curious about the blondes and the blonde blue eyes in my family. And I have a cousin that has um, blonde hair. My mother, when she was a child, she had blonde, blonde, blue eyes and it, it turned. And so I was kind of curious. I wonder, you know, where the, um, the white genes in my ancestry came from. And so I took the DNA. When I got home, I got the DNA results. And I, like, like many people, when they get the DNA results, it's not what they thought it was going to be. Right. So, you know, being Laotian and, and, and we were French colon colonized, I thought, well, maybe some of the Caucasian um, genes come from French, maybe they're Russian, maybe they're Mongolian, you know, some kind of Caucasian. So I always thought that growing up. And when I looked at it, it had no Caucasian, a 40% Polynesian, and the rest of it is basically- How could that be? Yeah, how, how could, could that, that be? be? Yes, I'm like, what? So I, I did one of those what moments. So a 40% yeah. Polynesian according to my DNA, and then the rest of it is just basically Northern Laos. Oh. And so I I actually end up arguing with the um, engineers and the, the people, the test makers, and I, I argue with them. I think I think you got my, my DNA mixed up with somebody else, you yeah. know, all that kind of stuff. And they said, absolutely not. They said, they looked it up. They said, um, you have the exact right results. Um, and I was like, well, I'm supposed to be a little bit white because my mother and my cousin, I told them the whole story. And they said, no, we're 99.9% .9 pretty positive that of our work. We know our work, we've done thousands and thousands of these tests and we do not deviate. There, uh, uh, there is zero Caucasian in your DNA, zero, okay? You got that, get that in your head. Yeah. And he, <laughs> I was getting schooled by the geneticist and he was like, listen, you're 14% Polynesian. Everybody gets like one or 2% African. It's just part of the, the test. And the rest of it is just Asian, you're just Asian. Okay, and I said, and I said, well, then where does the blonde and blue eyes come from in my family? They said, well, you know, we've had some, um, we've had some people who are of Hmong ancestry in northern Laos, and they've had the same thing in their DNA, where both parents were Asian, and they, um, they swear that they had some Caucasian again, no Caucasian. So, but they have in their family. So you're you're probably Hmong. So I said, okay, fine. I'm not going to argue with the, the, the geneticist anymore. So, um, so I took the material. I went to my mother and I, and I showed her the results. And I said, um, are we Hmong? And she said, of course we're Hmong. I said, oh, well, why did, why did you tell us that we're Hmong? And she said, well, it's, it's kind of something that you don't talk about. Because um, 
because you know we are here in the United States on a political asylum because we're Hmong. And the Hmong are a tribe of people in Northern Laos that helped with the US in the CIA secret war. And so, um, because your father helped write a lot of the, um, the, the paperwork and de- for different families affected by helping the, the, the CIA secret war, um, it put a marker on us and that's why we had to leave and, and we got asylum here. So you just don't talk about you being Hmong or anything in that area because you don't want to be a marker for yourself or anybody that you're related to that still lives in that area. It's not and safe. Laos, Laos is a socialist country, is it not? Um, I, yeah, I, I think they're they're, no. they're in that, yeah they're they're trying to figure it out. Uh, they're working on modernization. It, it's still a work in progress, but it's still for Hmong tribes a very um, it's still relatively unsafe because of the fallback or the fallout from the CIA secret war. Right. Um, they came in, the Hmong has been trying to get sovereignty for their tribe for as long as they can remember. They don't know right. how long, but as long as they can remember. And even um, it's the plight of the Hmong. And even um, in ancient, ancient times, uh, long ago, there's another folklore about the Hmong having tribal wars with um, different dynasties in the area in China, trying to get their own sovereignty. Hmm. And um, they lost and the, the Chinese dynasty at the time in that area had come through Northern Laos and killed off every single blonde Hmong there oh. that they could be. Even the babies. It, even the babies. They just did a complete genocide because they didn't want them to reproduce at all. Disgusting. And so that's the folklore. And so um, what happens, according to folklore, is um, the ones that survived were the ones that their hair didn't stay permanently blonde. It kind of turned dark. Their eyes kind of turned brown. And so those, those are the ones that survived. And so every couple of generations, you'll get among um, oh, maybe that will come out blonde or a combination of blonde blue like the eyes. Picture <laughs> that you sent me, the picture. Like the picture that I sent you. Yeah. So you don't get like somebody like my mom or somebody like my cousin who just come from completely northern Laos families. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's so so that right there tells you that maybe this folklore of the Hmong genocide from tribal might be true. Folklore, might be true because that would be true. Explained. Oh no! What are the mainstream yeah. academics going to do now? Yeah. Yeah. So that would explain why there are no more full tribes of blonde, blue-eyed monks. Ah. They now they come up in like spots in in the gen in the genes. It's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah. So so anyways, so I was like, okay, that's interesting. So um, I told my mom that and that's that's what she she explained. You know why we don't talk about you know being Hmong, but yes, we are Hmong. Um, and and yes, she knows that. In many Hmong families throughout history, you're going to get a cropping here or there. So it wasn't any new information to her, but she just don't talk about it. So it was new to me. But that's how I found out about my blonde Hmong link. Interesting. Must have hit you like a ton of bricks. Yeah, I'm not white. I'm not white. I, I, I spent my whole life thinking that I was part French or something. And now <laughs> I found out this. There's zero Caucasian. I'm, just, I'm, I'm as Asian as you can think, <laughs> as you can, as far back as you can see. I'm you don't Asian. have cravings for croissants and uh, French bread and uh, no, huh? Okay. Yeah, I do like French food, but there's absolutely no French. So <laughs> I'm, like, I'm completely Asian. Okay. And Polynesian. I want to know where the I want to know where the Polynesian came from in the middle of the you know the jungle. Right. How you got Polynesian in you? Right. So then I asked my mom. I was like, okay, so that explains. All right, I'm full Asian. We're full Asian, and where the blonde blue eyes come from. So the genetic markers must be so far in the front of your DNA. As a part, as opposed to the back end of it, so going that far back into your DNA, it's got to suggest of some other influence of right. some other kind of people, and then you have the mythology and folklore to go along with it. 
I right. think that highly suggests something. I mean, you know, right. I mean, okay, so go on. Right. So, okay, so that's been established where the blonde blue eyes comes from. All right, it's Hmong genes. All right, so then I asked my mother, I said, okay, fine. Um, where does this 14% Polynesian come from? Because I don't know of any Islander in our family. And my mom and her sister said, we don't either. <laughs> They said everybody as far back as we know have all been Laos. Amazing, huh? So we don't know where this 14% Polynesian comes from. The pyramid okay. builders, the engineers, I don't know. Maybe they came from Polynesia. Know. So so then so then the mystery got a little bit more interesting. So then I was like, huh, being in being curious as I am, um, I'm like, okay, well let, let's Let's see here. Let's just see here how far this rabbit hole goes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I was like, okay, the tribal folklore of, um, of the blonde Laotians, of, you know, the genocide from the tribal times, okay, that could explain why we all look the way we look now, many like Asian with some croppings um, throughout history of some blonde children coming here and there. Right. Um, but let's, let's take a look at the folklore. So I went back through my pictures from Laos and I studied, studied the artwork in the monasteries, of my mom's Buddhist temples that she funds. And I studied each one of them. And, and according to the artwork, which is again, the oral history of the people of the area and the plight all the way back through, you know, before Buddhism. So like many, like many spiritual traditions, they wrap the history of the people into the tradition. And so it kind of gets wrapped in. So that's, and, and so there's a lot of folklore um, about a ancient, large advanced civilization in the Pacific Island. Okay. That's the folklore. And the folklore is, what we would know as Lemuria or Mu. So I'm looking at this artwork and I'm like, okay, so let's just take a look at the Buddhist folklore that's documented this artwork and let's start, let's start seeing if it, it really, let's start, let's start, you know, following the leads. So I'm like, okay, so according to the mega flood, which is some way beyond 10,000 years ago, this flood came through wipes most most of the the land masses and anybody who survived went up to the mountains you know, all these, these mountains so it, that would mean is you would have people living up in northern china northern laos um you would have people in tibet you would have people on the top of islands in the pacific and so what i did was i started taking the buddhist folklore of the mega flood and I started basically going down the Pacific Islands. I started going down the Pacific Islands, island by island by island by island, just the following the folklore. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is what I found so far in my in my research. So the first thing I found was I went to Tonga, okay, and I just started researching every single island if they have a pyramid or if they have a megalith. That was my that was my my starting point. Do they have a pyramid or a megalith on these islands? Because according to the Buddhist folklore, the people that survived in ancient times live on top of these mountains. And then according to the folklore, after the waters subsided, they went back into the valleys of Asia and back into the areas and they re they tried to reestablish their culture. Okay. So that's the folklore. I so I started from Tonga. And went to Tonga and I saw that they did have a megalith and they called it the Ha Amanga Maui Polynesian Stonehenge, which are these megalithic Stonehenge type of structure. But I found that very interesting that they call it the Ha Amanga and that's short for Mung. I see. Okay. I see. So, okay, I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. All right, so short for Mung. So then, um, I went and in that in Tonga as well is they have what they call the Langi pyramid. 
platform and it's supposed it near the lost city of Mua, which is short for Ooh. lost city of Moo. Okay. <laughs> so, which is still here today. You can go and tour it um, and look it up. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So you have peoples of the Ha'amanga, Hmong, that live close to the lost city of Mua. Moo. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So, so I like okay. I don't make conclusions or anything else until I, you know, I get all the information and then and then I present it. So then I looked at it a little bit more, and then I saw in the Micronesian islands. Okay, there's a lot of small little islands as well. In the Micronesian islands, they have this megalithic structure called the Nan Madal. Okay. Okay, and the Nan Madal has been researched and it's a very popular tourist spot in the Micronesian Islands. And it's basically these huge megalithic um, stones that are piled up um, on a coral. Okay, and it's, it's, it's this kind of like this burial reef um, section of the islands that is built with these megalithic structures and it basically made a small little city on top of the water in the coral. So wow. the folk, so they don't really know a lot, but the folklore goes. With those basal, giant basal um, blocks, I guess, yep. all stacked up in the middle of the ocean there. And you're saying to yourself, how did these people transport these things over there? They must have had a pretty big boat. Yeah. yeah. And they're huge, they're huge, and there's <laughs> lots of them. Yeah. And um, according to the, they don't really know, according to the folklore in that area and the peoples who tell their oral story of their history, which many outsiders find the folklores of the indigenous tribes so um, outlandish according to their perception of things that they call it mythology and folklore. Right. Or, but to the indigenous people, it's their oral tradition of how they record keep their history. history. So, yeah, there's a difference. Now, remember, I had I had in in the Buddhist monasteries that my mother supports artwork and fun of building. The oral history of the people are documented in their artwork in right. these monasteries. Okay, these are their history. Um, so whether you think is well, the one culture thinks is the mythology or not, these are their stories so that they don't lose that, that knowledge. So anyways, with the man, Nan Madal megalithic coral city on the edge of the Micronesian islands, the, the oral history goes that, um, there wasn't very many people living on these islands at the time. But there's two stories. One folklore is that um, there was less than two dozen people that had came off these huge boats um, with stuff on it. And they had their seafaring and they came in and they settled in that area and they built these megalithic like a uh, seaside um, colony for themselves to live in. Now, the, according to the folklore, these people were extremely huge. They're or what we would call giants. They're extremely huge people. And, um, and they, you know, end up settling. And then over time, they um, would, they would uh, have children and assimilate with the local people in the area. And from having children with shorter people, they had smaller children children and then smaller children over time, you know, smaller, smaller and smaller, but they're still large in comparison right. to um, average people. But according to the folklore, um, the original ancient peoples of these megalithic structures on um, the Micronesian islands, they, um, they did it with levitation technology. And they would levitate the stones wherever it came from because it, and it, they would levitate the stones over to where they needed to be and then build it and set it up. And they would just keep building and building up, uh, up their cities. So that's the folklore. Now, the Buddhist folklore that I'm familiar with is levitation technology as well. 
Interesting. And a lot of Buddhism is around harmonics. I harmonics. See. And harmonics and frequency to make um, things levitate or to make it kind of weightless. That's the Buddhist folklore. Um, so, so I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. It kind of falls right in line with my Buddhist folklore that I know. That's one story for Namadal in the Micronesian Islands. The other folklore for how this um, basalt megalithic city, coral city was built was there was two giant brothers who came to the islands on a boat and they built Nan Madel. And one brother had died and the other brother survived and he ended up having children with, um, you know, a local woman and he had, um, and his children, you know, ended up being a lot of these um, ancient ones of the tribes okay. in this area. And over time, they would become chiefs and then kind of look out for the people on the island and so forth. So I sent you a picture of an elder who sent me a picture of the chiefs of these islands. So there is um, there's, there's a chief of, uh, of the Fiji island, uh, the chief of Fiji, and he actually denounced his, um, his chief status, and he's, he's a pastor. Kaliova um, Shelewau, Shelewau, Kaliova Shelewau of Fiji, seven foot, seven inches tall. Yeah. And then oh, the other wow. one. <laughs> yeah. The other chief, he's actually um, from the, I think it's the. Um, Tui Nayaratu, Sir Kamakis. Yeah, the, the Lao Islands. Yeah, the Lao Islands. And he, he's a chief as well. Yeah. Yeah, he's so, a big guy. And these are real people. These are real people. Yeah, and these are not folklore. These are real are people folklore. who exist, who are these giants. Are people, yeah, <laughs> these are real chiefs that live amongst us that exist. According to the story of these islands, their chiefs are the a smaller, shorter forms of the descendant ancient ones that first came into Very the island and created these megalithic structures. Hmm. Okay. I see. There, there is more evidence of these giant ancient ones, but that's Micronesia. I so I was like, okay, interesting. I'm actually talking to um, an elder from the Marshall Islands and the Lee Society Islands coming up. Cool. But uh, Micronesia has got a lot of good folklore, so oh, working yeah. on Micronesia. Yeah. Um, so anyways, going down the line of the Pacific Islands, I remember I'm following the Buddhist folklore about the mega flood and everybody right. who survived uh -huh. and we established a society did it on top of these islands. So the next island I went to is I was like, okay, well, that's Micronesia. Um, let's look at Indonesia. So I went to Indonesia and like, well, there's gotta be, um, if this folklore is true, there's gotta be a megalith and some kind of folklore around it. <laughs> and what do we have? We have the Bada Valley of megalithic jars and statues. I mentioned that. I mentioned that to uh, my subs when I had talked about you in the video about this other field of jars in Indonesia. And uh, do we see a direct relationship there? It seems to be because I don't hear about any other giant megalithic jars anywhere else. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so Indonesia, and that's actually a, a fun tourist spot as well. So in Indonesia, yeah, they have hundreds of megalithic jars that uh, are 10, 15, 20 feet or so high. Wow. Um, megalithic jars, some with lids on them uh -huh. in disarray. And there's these huge megalithic statues that, you know, somewhat resemble Easter Island type statues that okay. kind of existed as well. So I'm like, okay, so more megalithic. And I was like, where did I see these jars besides the plain <laughs> jars in Laos? Hundreds, which is another site where there's hundreds of megalithic jars with lids on them. 
Another giant Super Bowl party. Here. Another giant Super Bowl party. Different year, I guess. So whatever, but who knows? But okay, there's there's more, and they're not nicely organized. They're just kind of scattered all over the place in the Indonesia. And then and then I was like, I was like, okay, let's investigate what's around Indonesia some more. And in Indonesia, they have Ganang Padang, which is a twenty-five thousand year old pyramid. Wow. And that they carbon dated to be about 25 or more, at least, thousand years old. And well, how could that be? We're supposed to be cavemen running around with uh, grass skirts and no shoes and mumbling and babbling and just hunting and no agriculture. And yeah, how could that yeah. be? They were building pyramids then. I, I guess maybe They're they have pyramid. that wrong, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, but. yeah. this is older. It, it carbon dates to be even older than Egypt. So Egypt's got beautiful pyramids, but we have even older ones. So the rabbit hole go in terms of how old humanity is goes even deeper. Oh yeah. Okay. So I know this that. Is, so at this point, if this is starting to challenge you, please turn off this video and see something fun on YouTube. Go look yeah. at puppy. It won't be challenging anybody on my channel, that's for sure. <laughs> So, they'll be they're um, drooling for more. That's what they want. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so Nekanang Padang. So it's a 25,000 year old pyramid. Um, some archaeologists and geologists um, actually have been measuring the sonar and they found that there is actually a hollow area huh. that goes straight down Ooh. underneath the pyramid. And so they want to like uncover it and send something down to see what's on the bottom of this 25,000 yeah. year old pyramid as the bottom of this straight shot canal. But then the the, the, the government officials stop them and yeah. won't give them permit anymore to investigate any further. That's a problem. That's a problem. It seems to be a worldwide problem. They they don't wanna, you know, well, I, it's almost understandable to a certain extent. They don't want to wreck the integrity of the monument in order to discover more about it. That's why they were grateful when some of these places got bulldo bulldozed down by accident or on per accidentally on purpose or whatever it is. But then they were like, oh, well, that'll give us an opportunity to look at it because they're not going to take that opportunity is what it is, is that somehow they can't figure out how to take these things apart and put them back together again. Don't you find that interesting? Here's the 21st century and there's not enough confidence out there to put them back. So it just goes to show you that the people who built these things, maybe, uh, maybe they're a little bit more advanced than uh, even us, possibly, maybe, in yeah. those areas, yeah. you know, stone Ganang construction. Yeah, Ganang Padang is a huge mountain pyramid, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's huge, so, so look it up. So a 25,000 year old pyramid on top of Indonesia. All right, Indonesia, check, that follows the folklore. Next island, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dotting down the folklore. So yeah. then I go to the Philippines. If this folklore is true, let's see what's on top of this island. The Philippines has what they call the Chocolate Hills, yeah, and they look I'm like fascinated these, by that. Yeah, they look they're they're these huge they're these huge hills, and they look like little cones all over the place. Uh huh. But they're not little; they're huge hills that are in the shape of cones, just random scattered all over the so, place. So, so man-made, man-made earthen structures that are these pointy cones or whatever it is. Yeah, I'm not sure if I sent you a picture of that. No, but okay. it sounds fascinating because that's not so easy to do. You know, try building an earthen mound yourself and then going out after the rainstorm to find out that the thing got all washed away. But somehow these things did not. So they Yeah, it's the not a regular mountain. Building. It's not a regular mountain. They're cones. They're yeah. like they're like cones Even all over harder. the place. Even harder yeah, to construct or to last, uh, uh, you know, indefinitely. So yeah, yeah, and they're not small hills; they're big. They're big. I got to see have to actually of climb them. them to get. Yeah, I got to I gotta take a look them. at that. That's yeah, so awesome. the chocolate hills of the Philippines, huh. and according to the Filipino folklore, for how it happened. Okay, because right now there's a lot of dirt growing over it and, you know, it's kind of been engulfed by nature, but you can still see the huge chocolate hills. 
So the folklore is that there was a war between two giants ah. in ancient times. Uh -huh. And they threw rocks. These two guys threw rocks at each other. And they were, it was a power struggle, struggle over the empire. So they threw these rocks over back and forth at each other between these two giants. And, and all the rocks piled up and made these cone-like huge hills. Uh -huh. okay. um, that's the folklore. Gotcha. And um, at the end of this war of giants in the Philippines, these two um, ended up selling their differences and they went off and had a party. <laughs> They went out to, to have a party somewhere to drink and have a party and celebrate their victory. But Maybe they did with not some big old jars with lids on them that had <laughs> something in it. I don't know. Maybe. But... So they did not clean up their mess. They just left the islands and went to a party. So biodegradable. Heard, biodegradable. We heard of the Super Bowl of Giants having this big drinking party somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. They went to Indonesia. They went to Laos. That's where they went. They went to Laos, and they may <laughs> have also went to. Um, they, they have also went to uh, the valley, the valley of megalithic jars over in Indonesia as yeah. well, to the, the nearby island and party there. So, you know, it's just kind of funny. So you have a folklore of a war of giants, and then leaving to go and have a and party. Have a party. Okay, in sure. In these two different areas yeah. um, and there's evidence through these megalithic jars of hundreds of jars in the in northern laos and also in, in maybe indonesia. they had separate parties maybe one they had guy separate went parties. to indonesia and the other guy went to laos yeah right? the winner went there and the, and the loser went there yeah there you go <laughs> there it you would go. it would be hilarious but so at least they have some kind of humor um <laughs> yeah yeah so anyways um <laughs> So that's the folklore with the chocolate hills of the Philippines. So I'm like, cool. oh, that's interesting. Let's Very. see how far down this rabbit hole goes. And so, um, so then I go, you know, on the, um, on the, on the, the Philippines. Also, they also have on top of, um, I'm sorry, on top of Easter Island. So my Easter Island, they have the Vinapu megalithic wall. Yes familiar okay. with that yeah yeah so everybody is familiar with the easter island statues but they also have these yeah megalithic walls and other megalithic structures there as well as far as i know there's right. more than just the wall there's many other things that you don't often see you just see the maui things there and malawi figures right. or whatever they are right see and they don't yeah, that's see, what they, they focus uh, on. They don't really focus on because I guess once you've seen a megalithic wall, you've seen them all or something like that. But it's not true. I mean, when you come to think about when you see the size of the blocks there that they use, you have to say to yourself, you know, this is a little bit more than you can possibly imagine because they're perfectly cut and they fit together with each other precisely. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, we don't even have machinery today that can cut the sizes of some of these things without great difficulty. Let alone move. Let alone yeah, forget move. about moving. Yeah. yeah, that's a whole different ball game yeah. altogether. Let alone move. So yeah. moving these megalithic um, wall and the equipment across the island yeah. is a big thing. So anyways. Couldn't and, have been easy. Yeah. Couldn't so have been it, easy. So in Easter Island or on Easter Island, you know, everybody's familiar with the um, the, the statues on Easter Island. Right. And they have recently um, started to uncover that there's a whole body for the heads. They all have bodies underneath right. them. Underneath, and right. Underneath. So they're like, oh, my God, you see, there's even more. And they're huge. Gigantic. So they're not just heads. They made the whole body. Yeah. So as they are digging into the ground, they just uncover the tip of what's on Easter Island. As they're digging into the ground, they see these... The first one they came across was the Vinapu megalithic walls. And then as they dig it further, further down, like this just keeps on going. <laughs> and these megalithic walls look a lot like the Machu Picchu walls of Peru. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're like intricate. They're like huge and just kind of like perfect. So they're like, whoa. Um, 
And of course, the people of Easter Island don't know um, anything about, you know, the ancient ones of Easter Island. Um, they like the people, you know, so they came uh, later, possibly, maybe they know. came later, they don't really know. Right. But I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, um, so now you have Easter Island has megaliths. Um, and I am trying to find more folklores of East of Easter Island. So now we go to Hawaii. So I made okay. it up. Hawaii. So I go to Hawaii. I'm like, I know Hawaii pretty good. You know, I go there quite a bit. So I'm like, is there a pyramid on Hawaii? <laughs> Cause I know Hawaii pretty good. There's a pyramid Girl. on Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect? I mean, you know. What do you expect? And it's the Wamea Pyramid. Okay, uh -huh. it's a bit of a stretch to go into that part of Hawaii because it's unchartered, but it is there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the Wamea Pyramid. It fits right into the alignment of what a pyramid is with the mat mathematical proportions, all that. But there is a folklore, an uh, old Hawaiian folklore about the pyramid and the people. And the folklore actually goes, they actually accredit to Lemuria. They said that the ancient, ancient Hawaiians are, uh, were displaced people from a large, advanced, ancient a Asian civilization in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the folklore goes that, that they were there after the flood. Hmm. So, so you have this ancient, the Marian folklore of the ancient Hawaiians and that matches the folklores of ancient Laotians and Southeast Asians and the folklores documented in the Buddhist. So it's a, um, common, a common mythology, a common folklore with all of these people that's almost identical in many ways. So that seems kind of funny since these people often have said by anthropologists had no real contact with each other. How could yeah. they possibly? Well, they knew that they supposedly came from somewhere else or whatever, but you know, their theories are, you know, so vague and gray where you have the mythologies and the folklore is actually being a bit more specific. Yeah, the you know, folklores are very and, and not something that you would say, oh, that's you know, can't believe that, you know. I mean, it sounds right. totally credible, you know. So, yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, Hawaii's got one. Check. Let's go to the next island. Let's follow <laughs> the folklore. And so then I go to New Zealand. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'm like New Zealand is pretty remote, you know. So I'm like, okay, New Zealand, and I found megaliths and like. The Lee Society and the you know small Micronesian islands. Okay, let's see what's in New Zealand. And then the New Zealand they have um, what they call the Kamanawa Wall Mystery. Uh huh. Yeah, I've heard another of it. megalithic. I've seen pictures of it. It's it almost looks like the Easter Island one in some ways. You know, mm -hmm. and it's that's all there is to it. I mean, at least of what they uncovered so far. I don't know how much archaeology is being done in New yeah. Zealand, but I know what I've seen of it. It looks very similar to the Easter Island wall in a lot of yeah, respects. yeah. So these wall mysteries on all these different islands along the Pacific coast are starting to look like they came from the same school almost. So this they look very similar. Sure. So you have a megalithic wall mystery there, but. In New Zealand, there, you know, I, I, there's not as much tribal folklore. So I'm trying to uncover what if there is any tribal oh, folklore right. in New Zealand. You have to so, go deep. And so then I go to the next island. Let's go to Australia. Like, all right, Australia. That's a pretty big landmass. Yeah, it's a continent. So let's see really, what's yeah. in Australia. <clears throat> so what do I find in Australia? Um, you have the Jimpy Pyramid. Yeah. The Jimpy Pyramid in Australia happens to have the Gosford hieroglyphs. Right, those Egyptian hieroglyphs, yeah. Written on the pyramids in Australia. So they don't know the origination of the hieroglyphs on the Jimpy Pyramid. They think maybe somebody did that as kind of like as a job or at some point somebody put that there or whatever, but how is ancient hieroglyphics on a pyramid in Australia? Yeah. 
Well, that people know about that. We don't even know how to read hieroglyphics even today. Right. So how did they get there? I mean, they call it a hoax. They say that call somebody did that. Who would go out there and waste their time carving all those things in there? Would they take a lunch every day over there so they could yeah. do all that? Nobody <laughs> saw them doing it or anything. Yeah. I don't know. I'm a bit dubious of, of that. Yeah. And I'm starting to think that maybe there's some connection there, but we always want to think the flow is one way. So, you know, let's say people say, oh, well, there's Egyptian hieroglyphics there. Well, that means that the Egyptians went there. Why does it necessarily have to be that? And for, for everyone's information, by the way, this is my own research, okay? There was a major, major cataclysm and catastrophe in Australia, just Australia, some 30 to 40,000 years ago, separate and apart from many other cataclysms. So a major cataclysm or catastrophe happened to Australia some 40,000 years ago, 30, 40,000 years ago, mm -hmm. they believe. And this could have eliminated the majority of constructions on the surface there of the mm -hmm. island could have eliminated a lot of that and and of course at being the sea level being lower that many of the constructions could have been um along the shoreline too yeah. so we don't yeah. know but but there was a major cataclysm there some 30 that's fairly recent in cataclysmic you know dating goes right and then we had a later one in north america of course you know the horse and the camel originally come from North America, where strangely they became extinct there, but they left North America to populate the rest of the world. That's the origination point of the horse and the camel is mm -hmm. North America. Yeah, I think I, I think as we as we start doing more investigations it into our mysterious past, we're going to start, there's going to be a need for a lot of different disciplines to start collaborating, like it's geology. Multidisciplinary. Yeah, yeah, not just archaeologists, you're talking anthropologists, you're talking historians, you're talking artists, um, architects. Artists, yeah, architects. People who can make sense okay. of things that other people can't. Marine Especially. biologists, you, you're talking. Sure. Um, a lot of technology or everything has to come into play and and, and everything oh, is being employed now but the problem with contemporary archaeology and anthropology is that they have a preconceived notion of what went on in the past so if you have a preconceived notion you're not looking for new evidence that contradicts that what you're trying to do is make the evidence that you find fit into that preconceived notion and that's one of the problems in archaeology and anthropology today because if anybody steps out of their boundary let's say that they were allotted by their deans mm -hmm. and everybody else they're treading on dangerous water because they'll be quick to be ridiculed and put down their peer you know their reports that they wish to have peer reviewed won't be peer reviewed you know all of these sorts of things so that's yeah. the problem with contemporary archaeology today they have a preconceived notion of what the past is therefore everything they find has to fit within that framework otherwise they can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense or whatever. They just sort of leave it alone. Right. And that's that's turning around now. Uh, you know, as, you know, younger generation comes up and gets educated and they've been exposed to all these things. They've been exposed to research like mine, like yours, other people who came before us, etc. They're starting to question the whole validity of the old arguments in archaeology, which was often a lot of their um, their premises are already 100 years old, 150 years old. It hasn't changed in all that time, you know, so yeah. right. it's, it's starting right. to crack, I think, a little bit. But I mean, you know, we, we have, we're instrumental, I think, you know, people like you and me are instrumental in sort of helping, you know, um, dispel people's preconceived notions about what the past may be and 
you know, certainly these stories and the research and the things that you're uncovering about all of these islands in the Pacific and the mainland, Asia, etc., are totally challenging all of these old ideas. And, you know, I think it's time to get rid of them. Even the Smithsonian is revising their ideas. It's, it's, a, it's a period of change. We're going to go through some changes uh, but I think it's going to be rough. It's not going to be without spasms. It's going to be a rather spasmodic yeah. change, if you know, if I want to characterize it as anything. Right. So, but it's beginning to crack because more people are writing books about it, and uh, these kind of ideas, new ideas, are coming to the forefront with people. So, yeah. you're going to definitely be instrumental in this. So, so. Were there so, any other? So, uh, so you found in, in you found you talk about Australia and the Egyptian pyramid that happens to be there for some strange reason. What else yeah. does Australia have? Anything so, else? Australia is interesting, and you know the thing is the Aboriginals of Australia. I have yet to speak to one, but I really want to speak to some Aboriginals to get their folklore right around the areas because different aboriginals may not speak different tribes may not speak to each other because it's such a large la land mass so sure. i want to speak to an elder um who live close around the jimpy pyramid right okay right. um right. there's another smaller pyramid um that's kind of fallen in disarray not as good in condition as the jimpy pyramid and the hieroglyphs on that but that's australia so i then i go to samoa another island dotting down the Pacific Islands, um, where Lemuria is supposed to be, according to the Buddhist folklore. So I go to Samoa, right. and Samoa is not that big. So I'm like, no, oh, let's see what we find. And of course, there's one something there too. There is the <laughs> there's a pyramid in Samoa, <laughs> and the Samoa pyramid is called the um, Hule Mele Mound Star Pyramid. Right. Hule Mele Mound. And it's a small pyramid, but there's one there, and there isn't a lot of information and research done on that pyramid. Like there is not a lot of research and information done on many of these megaliths and pyramids on top of mountains along the Pacific Islands. So if anybody wants to do some archaeology, you know, <laughs> have at it. It's all there for you, and we're giving I you. I just the recently did a video about the star mounds over there. Mm -hmm. Archaeologists and anthropologists believe that the chieftains of the islands use those mounds, these star mounds, which may or may not be true, or they may not be the originators of the mounds, but the chieftains use them to catch pigeons. There's a certain kind of Pacific pigeon that the Samoans, it was only for chiefs though, you couldn't, the regular people didn't need it, but they caught these pigeons on these mounds for uh, culinary, the chief's culinary desires. Yeah, that's, a, that's the story about them. They were used to catch these pigeons. You know, they catch them in these like box, you know, you put a little seed down and you pull the string when the pigeons eat yeah, and that's yeah. how they caught them. But I find it difficult to believe that they built these ultra symmetrical precisely built kind of mounds just to catch pigeons with catch but you know i mean they obviously have some deeper meaning that we're not familiar with but but you know maybe you know somebody like you will get to the bottom of it you know you speak to some yeah. samoans or something like that you know maybe you'll you'll get to the bottom of what these mounds in the pyramid there what what it could be so what else they got in Samoa? Just those yeah. mounds, see, the star yeah. mounds and the star so, pyramid? Just, just, just the, the star pyramid in Samoa. So then, um, and again, the Samoa chiefs, especially the older Samoa chiefs, are very tall. tall. <laughs> <laughs> and this seems to be a pattern with these Polynesian yeah. chiefs. All these wow. chiefs are like not normal size. In the Americans <laughs> too, I have to say, but that, you'll get to yeah. that later. Yeah, okay. of course, the folklore, all these chiefs are descendants of giants, so that settle into the area. That's the folklore. They are. You dot they are. island by island, they, they all start looking the same. Yeah. Uh, some are, so I think some are quite handsome, but that's my personal perspective. Yeah, um, that, they look pretty <laughs> handsome to me. <laughs> They look pretty handsome, like pretty handsome yeah. guys to me. They yeah, weren't like, you know. Guys. Yeah. So anyways. Um, easy on the eyes, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, like Aquaman. Yeah, right. <laughs> like Aquaman. Well, muscular and everything. They look like yeah, you're yeah, in great shape. Her... I'm jealous. I'm not yeah, tall and like... I'm not muscular. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so... enough on these Chiefs and their good DNA. Um, next island. So I went to I went to Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, small island in the Pacific. Not much going on. Let's see what they have. And of course, they have <laughs> pyramid points. Pyramid points. Of course. Of course, Papua New Guinea, very tribal island, and they have pyramid points. And they don't know very much about pyramid points as well. So that's still very. Um, th there's a lot of mystery around that as well. And remember, a lot according to the folklores that I've come across so far with these Pacific islands. They, so much time has gone by that, you know, millennia, millennia has gone by that, that some of these folklores completely have been forgotten. Sure. So, um, sure. and like I know with the Hmong tribe of Laos, like, um, there, there is a, and many of them still live in the mountainous area because they want, they're still trying to kind of have a stronghold and, and, and try to sovereignty for their tribe which i really hope they do because they're basically they're almost, like they're, you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of the basque people yeah the basque people have 45 percent of their dna they have no clue as to where it comes from no clue and the basque people have been trying to have their sovereignty for millennia now too they can't seem to get it but there's some very different people as well with yeah some, yeah some other my, weird dna and yeah they have my tails they're, they're born with tails a lot of the people are born with tails yeah my ex-husband is is basque <laughs> it's funny you say that so i'm very familiar with the bass so um Anyways, but with the, with the Hmong, they're basically, and like the Basque people and these tribes, uh, these small tribes around the world that have been for as long as they know trying to get sovereignty, they're basically like Native Americans in their own land, trying yeah. to get sovereignty from um, the country in which their tribe exists in, like Tibet, like Tibetans trying to get sovereignty through China. Right. So anyways, I, I, you know, maybe in telling their story, it helps them somehow get some peace and um, be able to live in harmony um, without feeling like... Um, Unique and individual yeah. and not yeah. some well, just nobody faceless person in this world. And so yeah. many of us, you know, I don't know how many different types of DNA I have in me, but it seems the women in my family were very, um, uh, they weren't very picky. So, <laughs> so it could be like anybody. So, I mean, so I'm just like a mutt of all these different things. And I'm one of these mud people that I talk <laughs> about or whatever. I mean, I don't know what the heck DNA I got in me, but I'm jealous of anybody who has so like pure DNA because they, you know, and those are the ones that most benefit from oh. you know, knowing their knowing their histories and knowing their past. Whereas the rest of us here are like, huh? Wow. Well, you know, you know, Dave. Um, I think, and this is as a writer, especially with this um, book project that I'm working on for the next two years, of getting the um, the folklores around these pyramids and megaliths you know, going continent per continent and, and having a book series on, on, on different folklores and different continents around these megalithic structures is that I will do the best that I can to document the folklore as they're, they're told without sugarcoating, without, you know, changing anything. This is just what is reported. This is, reported. This is what was told. This is how it is. It right. pertains to these areas you decide what you want to decide because at some point in the future we are going to have the technology and the resources and um the generations of the future that will have that in their their arsenal will look at these books that you know and this research that you and i and other people do and go okay just like the example of the lost city of troy Right. And the, the businessman who, you know, almost lost his whole shirt on that venture, following the folklore of Troy going. And they were laughed at. They oh, were yeah. laughed he, at. They said, like, you're I never going to find it. It's a myth. It, you're, 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 you know, you're on a wild goose chase. You're, you know, you're chasing clouds. And 
you know, lo and behold, they found it. Yeah, and, and he went his... off those folklores. He was like, according to these folklores, this is the area. The, exactly. This is the area. And they looked and they looked and they looked and they looked. And fortunate for us, he saw a little shiny object that bounced off the sun in the ground and was like, what's that? And started digging and digging. And then they found... Um, you know, jewelry, and they found the lost. Was it before. Schliemann? I'm trying to think of who the archaeologist was. I, I should know. I've, I've read it a whole bunch of times. I'm not sure. If, was it Schliemann? No, maybe not, but or it might have been. I just I forget, but it doesn't matter. The point yeah. is, is that you have this mythology mm -hmm. of the city of Troy. We all learned about it in school and blah, blah, blah. But there was a point where people were learning about it in school as a myth. It didn't mm -hmm. exist. They had mm -hmm. no evidence of it, so therefore it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But as I say on my channel, this is a legal sort of aphorism, okay? And it goes like this. A absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. If you can understand that, it's a little bit logic kind of play on words. So, so... So absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. So in other words, you don't find something or rather it doesn't mean that it wasn't actually there. You just haven't found it yet. Yep. Yep. That's all. But th just because you don't find something doesn't mean that it might have been there at some other time. You, we, we, we can't exist in other time periods. We can't be eyewitnesses to these things. So... It, that doesn't just because you don't find something or something said is a myth it's not there or whatever well what do you base that on simply because it's hearsay or third party or whatever it is that doesn't mean anything so right. it's it was the persistence of the archaeologist who right, right. which is just dog dogged persistence into investigating this thing which uncovered it finally and that's a tale for a lot of them like Tutankhamun's uh, tomb there uh what's his face there refused to give up and he was having a hard time about it Carter like Howard Carter and um his his uh financier almost gave up on him I and mean, he ended up in you know dying in like unrecognized and in, in, in poverty but he was the guy who is dogger, you know, persistence found Tutankhamun's yep. tomb. Yep. They all yeah, gave up so, on it. They thought there were no other tombs there to find. They really did. Yeah. They were done. They were just like, yeah, there's nothing else to find here. You're wasting your time and money and blah, blah, blah. Look what they found. Fast forward 67 years of technology. We're seeing new pyramids from sonar. From um, the Guatemala that, jungle. Like, the lidar, yeah. lidar is lidar is revealing yeah. revealing everything. It's really because it, the ground yeah. penetrating radar that I mean with the on the ground with in tandem with the lidar, so much. This I know so for a fact that yeah. in the Americas, there's literally literally millions of unexcavated sites, mm -hmm. millions of them. I want Not to see what's thousands. under. Like, Wisconsin, that pyramid on Lake Wisconsin. They, you know, they need to. There's other they, stuff in there. I mean, on my own channel, I had a couple of subs pointed out some stuff that was in Lake Superior, under the water. You know, there's some earthen walls and structures that, you know, how could that be? It's these big giant lakes filled with water. You know, so there's a lot of mystery left, and 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 where is. Other parts of the world have been, you know, completely sort of examined, but not really, but, you know, more so than the Americas and especially North America. North America is the last bastion of archaeology because it stopped at some period in the past. They passed the laws about the indigenous people and their sacred places, etc. So now, you know, it's more or less has silenced archaeology and anthropology and what we're left with is something like what I do is try to extract some sort of truth 
from accounts from the past, often sometimes not, you know, what you would call official accounts. But right. uh, like the mythologies and folklore, they're not official other than the fact that they're official mythologies and folklores, but that they're not either. But what does that mean? Does it mean that they're not completely not true? And as they know, there's a bit of fact in every fiction, every anyway. Right. right. So yeah, what are those facts? That's the thing, right. you know. So hopefully your research is going to enlighten us to the whole Asian part of this big puzzle. puzzle. Well, you know what? It's you have other you people like that. me focusing on the Americas and people focusing on Egypt and people focusing on the Middle East and people focusing on Africa and India and blah, blah, blah. And you're, I mean, probably a few, you know, among a few people who are going to put this whole thing together. And I don't think anybody else has. Not that I can recall. Well, I'm 40, so I expect to live until at least my 100. <laughs> Well, God, you know, yeah. so, or you beyond, know. <laughs> or beyond. Maybe you'll no, download I'm... your consciousness or something like oh, that. God. Oh, God. No, yeah, into me the a AI. robot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I will probably be the bug. <laughs> if my consciousness was uploaded, I might you be the bug. You know what? I think <laughs> our consciousnesses <laughs> are downloaded anyway into the, <laughs> into the morphic field for the human oh, that's race. That's true. the one mind. So yeah. anyway, one last one last island on my on my initial research. Go ahead, I can't wait to hear so, it. Last island, Japan. Yeah. Japan. You know, we think of Japan as this very modern civilization. You know, in Asia. So what what do they have? Did, would they have anything ancient, megalithic pyramids? Would they? And and they do. It wasn't until maybe about. 10 or so, not, I mean, pretty recent. Yanaguni. A diver, a diver, like, uh, off the coast of Japan, not far off the coast. He went diving in this remote area, and he saw this huge underwater pyramid structure off the coast of megalith. Japan. Megalith. They, they call it the giant Yona, megalith. Yonaguna pyramid. Yeah. Yeah, it's an underwater Yonaguna underwater pyramid, and it's huge. It looks, it just looks so surreal how megalithic these these boulders are that created this uh, pyramid underwater. They they just keep going and going. It's like this is huge. It's it's bigger than anything that they've seen um, in terms of megalithic um, building equipment to build this pyramid. It's all underwater, and so people would dive there for tourism if they want to. Um, and then in this area as well, on the mountaintops of Japan are megaliths surrounding the area as well. It's kind of remnants of megalithic structures, remnants of yeah. megalithic yeah. Um, artwork. So I was like, oh, megalithic artwork. You know, in when I was in Northern Laos looking at, because I went to um, a couple of ancient temples and one of the ancient temples was it was a, a mini replica of Angkor Wat, and it kind of faces towards Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia. Yeah. But when you walk up to the very top of it, um, you go into this mountain, and you know, there's a Buddha statue on top of the mountain. But I didn't send you a picture of this, but in the top of the mountain there, you know, this Buddha statue, but then you have this huge kind of like a square megalithic um, stone on top of this mountain, and part of the person that was um, meditating there, the the, the Buddha um, that it was meditating there had used that. And then there's some, there's more um, kind of like square um, granites, and then other. And then the other thing is in this mountaintop, there's like this perfect cutout right into the mountaintop, and it's hard stone, just perfect cutout. But on the way up to it, there are these megalithic um animal um carvings Epigen, on yeah. huge granite like mm -hmm. they look they're, they're animal carvings of um of snake or of um a um sure. an elephant yeah yeah, or, yeah but they're they, they're megalith they're like these huge megalithic granite nice perfectly structured carvings wow and they, they have similar carvings in the megaliths surrounding the 
underwater pyramid in Japan. Amazing. Yeah, so, I know. I've seen some of them. And yeah. they've done a lot of work on that Yanaguni. And just to mention, too, they also have in Japan, You were gonna. I know you're going to mention the cell, the big, huge, megalithic, rock-cutting, uh, just interesting, weird, um, cut, you know, megalithic cut block and carved block. And mm -hmm. just... But they also have at the Emperor's Palace there, they have megalithic polygonal um, polygonal um, stone wall there, mm -hmm. which is just like the ones at Machu Picchu and uh, around Peru, very yeah. similar. And you have the Ainu people, who were the original people in Japan before the Japanese got there. There's still some Ainu people left there. And the Ainu people also had a lot of um, Caucasian characteristics um, yeah. in, their, in their phenotype, in their morphology. So they're a very strange the people. <laughs> You know, I, you know, but, you know, they're, they're, I don't know if they could get pure Ainu DNA now, but there's still some Ainu people left there and they still retain some of their stories, I believe, too. Right. So hopefully I can talk to some of them and maybe one of them, one of them will do a DNA test and see, you know, where they're, that would um, be fantastic. they're blonde or red hair. Yeah, they um, have like blonde and, and white hair. And I mean, it just, and they don't look anything like Japanese. They look totally different. Yeah, and yeah. You know the thing. The thing also with um, the like, like I know with the Hmong tribe in northern Laos, like the Hmong tribe, um, we had, there was a tribal leader. He he recall in his lifetime when he was younger, there was maybe thirteen thousand people in his tribe. And now there's maybe less than two thousand because most of them died off from just regular um, disease. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we as we modernize and um, get, you know, people travel around, they 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 spread like smallpox did to Native Americans. You know, you yeah. you you infect each other and then you have to kind of adjust to each other's germs. So unfortunately, um, you know, and and even with the disease, the natural um, disease that kill off many of these indigenous tribes that are new to these foreign diseases, that they're not yeah. used to these foreign germs yet, mm -hmm. Um, e even with that, um, you know, they struggle to survive in modernization as well. Right. So there's an interesting um, thing happening with many of these tribes around the world. And I send a lot of love to these tribes. And if anything, writing their stories down, maybe at some point will help keep them alive in our canon, in yeah. our history. And at some point in the future, as technology becomes much more advanced, um, maybe the, the generations of the future will look into these folklores, um, just like I and you have and found, I mean, I just took a basic Buddhist folklore about the mega flood and just started going down the islands along the Pacific. What are the chances that I'm gonna find a pyramid and megalith and ancient folklores around these areas on each one of the islands that I go to? I mean, I've, I've had like so far, a hundred percent. You're right. Accuracy. Is, you know, defies it's any that challenges it. I mean, it's yeah. just so clear as day. I, I was thinking maybe I'm gonna find two or three every island I've gone yeah. to. It's kind of like how far down this is the rabbit hole go? And I'm like, is this Buddhist folklore really a folklore? No. Because I'm having a hundred percent accuracy in finding something in every island, no matter how big or how small in the Pacific. And it's worldwide. It isn't only yeah. Asia. It's worldwide. There's the, uh, there's the past as we know it is a fantasy story. Complete mm -hmm. fantasy. Go story. beyond five thousand years, people. Go beyond five thousand years. I don't even think beyond two hundred years. It's correct, mm -hmm. but you know it's. We don't know what the real story of the past was with these giant hominids wandering around the world with all different kinds of skull types, elongated skulls, skulls with horns, vaulted craniums, 
just a, a, a story of the past that more resembles J.R.R. Tolkien's trilogy and Hobbit yeah. than really resembles. And there's a lot of people who have said, you know, Tolkien drew upon the mythologies. That's where he got all the characters for his stories and his stories were all stories from folklore and mythology. It all developed from Santa Claus stories that he wrote to his kids about, the, you know, Santa's kingdom in the North Pole with the elves. and the, But, you know, he was a smart guy. He was a historian. He knew about all the mythologies and everything. So he put together this thing. And a lot of people say that's an accurate picture of what the past probably was like. Yeah. We just, we just you know, until we know, until... We learn more and I don't know in your lifetime or my lifetime, we're going to have the technology to really explore this mythology as far back as we can go, because we, we, we don't even know that much about the ocean. We don't even go that yeah. deep in the ocean because it's, we don't have the technology to go that deep, but just going um, below sea level, you know, to maybe 10,000 years back, we already see pyramids underwater. Now I actually sent you a picture. This is the last picture I sent you. Um, of the Palouse Fall, okay? Yes. And this is geological. I actually went and saw it myself. Yeah. All right. And this is a national park in Washington. It's called Palouse Falls Park. And it's scientific facts. And this is the evidence. And he's, um, Dave's putting it up on the screen. But basically, there is me. I see. Um, I see. Sitting on top of the of Palouse Falls. And that's where it... It, that's where the crater kind of the water came through but it's the it's one of the um major evidence of an ice age flood about thirteen thousand years ago according to the geology reports but the canyon there that looks a lot like grand canyon is actually the rest of palouse falls I see. so according to the ice age um geology reports um something happened that melted all the ice and this huge flood came through and just carved out these cannons and then flushed through and then just made this circle at the very end and ended up at Palouse Falls of making that nice little round amphitheater circle there. And that's what the evidence in the geology, I mean, it's just literally just like cut right down the mountain and just carved it out and washed it back out. Now, the bottom image of that is called the scab land. And the only way to see the scab lands, because I went, I went and did a river tour of the scab lands. And so you can't really see it because they, it looks like cliffs and hilltops and you can kind of see a little bit, but you can't really see the full pictures. It looks you surreal. Like it looks like, it looks like the uh, moon surface or something like that. It's, it's, it's a, it's a real picture of Eastern Washington and the color scab lines. And basically it's an aerial shot and you can see how big it is because those, li those little land markers are farms, farms. and those yes. are huge farmland patches and there's multiple patches. Those are huge. There's they're like multiple city wide patches. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the arrow, it, they call it the scab lands because it looks like a water came through and just receded down yeah. to the Columbia River. Hmm. That is not a small picture. That is no, it looks like, huge. That is huge. huge okay, you ever gone to the farm? You ever gone to the largest farm? Okay, each one of those patches is a large farm. Yeah. That's I can huge. see it's, it's, it's a small giant city. area. It's a really giant area. I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, my relatives, as I told you, are all from Bremerton over there. They don't know anything about that stuff. They don't, yeah. know, they don't watch anything anyway, but, but except, you know, they got their own little lives there in Washington State. But uh, it's beautiful there. I know I've been there and I love Washington State. It's, a lot of lot of wooded uh, mountainous area over there. It's yeah. just magnificent and the geological features of it. Oh my goodness. Unbelievable. The only bad part you got there is that nuclear plant there that's yeah. horrible and different different subject, but yes, I'm with you on that. But 
The Scablands and Palouse Falls Park is, if you're in Eastern Washington, that is a must see because that is geological physical evidence of a 13,000 year ago ice age flood that melted the ice and just came through and just now when they look at the geological evidence from Palouse Falls and the Scavlands uh -huh. and they follow where the water had come through because they follow the canyon all the way through right you will see through multiple states going into the midwest huge boulders just kind of sitting in disarray on the mountain yeah I've seen them just weird, like, how is this huge megalith just kind of dangling right there? Yeah, they look like they're there. stacked one on top like, of another. I've yeah. seen a lot of pictures of them, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to look far. You just look at disarray, um, huge rocks just hanging, just hanging. And it's not like somebody just took this huge, you know, boulder house size level rock and just stuck it on the top of a of yeah. huge yeah, but there's, it's a there's perch so much stone or a leaning stone, what we call a perch stone a lot of times are these and stones so that are like hanging and you will find often underneath it just one small stone tucked underneath it and holding it up and in position. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, in real, in essence, it's really a dolmen, but we call them perch stones over here yeah. on the East yeah. Coast. That's the geological evidence of the rocks, the huge boulder rocks that were carried all the way across multiple states following the flood path of this mega flood that went all the way through, carved out this canyon in Washington through the Scablands, whoosh, carved out, um, you know, Palouse Falls and then receded down. Um, and my, when you think about a multiple state flood about 13,000 years ago, yeah. and a lot of the folklores that I've come across, like the Laos folklores about the mega, the Buddhist folklores about over 10,000 years ago, a lot of the Micronesian folklores about floods were over 12,000 years ago, this falls right in line. Yeah. That, that would be the type of flood that would take down Lemuria and many of the advanced civilizations. Of you know who Randall world. Carlson is? You know Randall I, yeah, Carlson? Yeah, yeah, I did. I actually came across some of his stuff yeah. when I was looking at Palouse Falls. He talks like, about the cataclysms, and there's been many, many, yes. and many in North America as well that affected the indigenous peoples in these cultures, even Cahokia, for instance. They were wiped out by some sort of catastrophe. And whoever the people were there that rebuilt Monk's Mound, they repaired it. It was damaged. But the repair didn't take, and it sagged. It was a bad repair because they weren't the people who built it. Somebody else built it and who knew how to build earthen pyramids. And they just like dumped a whole bunch of earth on there and crossed their fingers, but you know, it was no good. But, and yeah. the reason why is because they didn't know how to build it. Nobody knows that's research from my channel. Everybody else just be, oh yeah, whoever in Cahokia, yeah, they built the pyramid. No, somebody else built them. And then the people who inhabited that area that we're familiar with from mainstream academias, babblings, whatever they are, those are the people who occupied it after. And they didn't yep. know anything about how it was built, how to build it, or any of those things. They may have kept some social traditions from the giant or large hominid cultures that were there from the past. They may have kept some of the social things from there, but they didn't keep any of the construction, engineering. They kept the astronomical information i believe they kept mm -hmm. some maybe of the mythology but they didn't keep any of their engineering or construction practices yeah. or even some of the other practices that they were engaged in that were very advanced canal building for instance and um, all sorts of hydrology etching um, metals the um, smelting and uh, pouring of metals. I mean, all of this stuff was done by those cultures. And later on, the Native Americans didn't do any of that stuff. Yep. 
Yep. So true. So true. That is exactly what I'm finding in my research. As I keep going down this rabbit hole, I'm seeing some very familiar patterns of um, a society, an ancient society that had normal people, that had um, giants. Um, I'm seeing even the Buddhist folklores of um, megalithic technology done by sound. Um, they the folklore goes that the sound can also carve. You can carve things using um, harmonics and frequency. And you can levitate things using harmonics and frequency. And that happens to be the similar um, story that's told about the ancient builders of these um, pyramids and megaliths all along the Pacific Islands. That happens to be the mythology or the method of how these were supposedly created according to their folklore as well. So, so wait, you, you wonder the Buddhist folklores about frequencies and harmonics and the tribal folklores in the, these different islands of these megalithic structures being done by frequencies and sound and levitation start sounding very similar. And even Buddhism, they'll say that they have acquired information from these displaced peoples of Lemuria. Right, right. Or at least some of it, whatever, but mm -hmm. it strongly suggests to me of a high technology, perhaps using some sort of machinery. Something. And, yeah. and you know, we see evidence of this all around the world, whether it be construction yes. projects where, you know, mm -hmm. Even if sound wasn't used, if you have a high technology, I assume that you're going to have all the types of equipment to accomplish all of these things. And like, and, actually, all, and right. tools go through all kinds of tools, go through evolutions of their own right. as they're used on particular kinds of machinery or whatever it is to build with, etc improvements on those things start to happen because the people who use it start improving they realize what the the issues are with it so they start to design it themselves we're not talking about people in of high engineering status but just people average people you know with practical use improving upon things but all yeah. tools go through an evolution so when you look at an ancient site and you realize well maybe this might have been done with some some high level uh, you know some more advanced tools or whatever it is it could have been done with tools in various stages from site to site but similar so it goes it goes way deep and what the ramifications often you hear okay well these people constructed this pyramid and you know there was all these people involved okay so all these people were involved you know constructing a pyramid well where did they live and who was feeding them because obviously if you're building pyramids you don't have time to go out looking for food and stuff like that yeah. you know so if you have like uh you know a thousand people building pyramid well who's getting food for them you know where are they getting all this food from to for these people is one guy going out and getting you know like a a hundred you know deers or, you know or whatever it is i doubt it i mean i it's a very highly organized. Yep. Um, I mean, even like Nan Madal, right? Even Nan, the megalithic um, coral city of Nan Madal in Micronesia. Right. Okay. Micronesia, even today, does not have the workforce to build Nan Madal. Right. So, where did they come island. from? That's always our questions okay. when we look at these things. Where did they get so the workforce? Their to folklore, do their folklore of the ancient ones. Um, building out of sound and frequency and levitating the stones and the stones being hollowed out through sound and frequency and levitating to where it's supposed to be to be put together makes more sense than the, the 3D explanation of, oh, these people from the islanders. But, these but islanders how about this? People. How about this? How about just the default, okay? Because when you look at some of these giant and you know large hominid species that may have been around okay so if you're 12 foot tall or 13 foot tall or perhaps they found skeletal remains here in the north uh, america here that are 18 feet tall 
I can tell you right now that me and my other 18 foot tall friend would just pick up one of those pieces of basalt like it was nothing and throw it right on the stack over there. No problem whatsoever. Because if you're 18 feet tall and you weigh about 3,000 pounds, you have the strength of an elephant. Okay? The mm -hmm. strength of an elephant. No machinery, no tools necessary. Just you and a couple of buddies lift one of these big giant blocks up that weigh tons and tons and tons. Or even just a group of 10 guys, you pull it along with a rope or something like that. That's all you needed. Because somebody who's 18 foot tall or even 12 foot tall has the strength of an elephant. Okay? And the elephants they had that time had 10 times the strength of our, our elephants because they were mammoths and mastodons. And you can't tell me that those people, the, being the fact that we can train any sort of Asian elephant, African elephant today, you're telling me that these giants in the past who were so smart, looking at the stars, building pyramids, doing all these things, didn't say, hey, you know, look at those mammoths over there. And uh, they're kind of friendly, you know, we give them some food and they pick it up and we talk to them and stuff. Why couldn't we train those mammoths and mastodons to move around some of that stuff for us? It's possible these people didn't start out with high-level sonic machinery. They had to start somewhere. So even the giants had their ancient past. They probably, yeah, know? they probably, um, it's very likely. I they almost had guarantee that. you that they grabbed those mastodons and mammoths and said, Hey, buddy, here's some peanuts for you. We're friends now. Can we pick up some of this stuff? And I bet you they rode them and everything. Because you see. Maybe ancient, they domesticated you them. You see, ancient, <laughs> I'm telling you that they did. Maybe they and did. Among <laughs> other things. And the reason why we have all the animals we have today, I believe some of them are as a result of genetic engineering or very high Absolutely. level, Absolutely. Um, you know, breeding and uh, practices. So... I guarantee you that they used those mastodons besides the fact that they were just incredibly strong themselves, personally, physically. Well, definitely. You know, and I you mean, see, a lot of as a matter of fact, I've seen so many carvings of statues. They'll show somebody on the back of like a human type person on the back of an elephant, and the elephant looks like a little pony. Looks like a, there's a big giant guy sitting on an elephant and the elephant looks like a little tiny, you know, one of these little ponies you have at the fair, you mm -hmm. know? So what's with that? I mean, if you're that big and an elephant is that size, why do you need an elephant for to move stuff around for? You just do it yourself and keep the elephant there as a pet to keep you company. Right. That, 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 that is a hypothesis for Asia, but for the Pacific Islands, we don't know if you're bringing stuff there on big giant boats. Maybe. You're bringing elephants along with you and mastodons and mammoths yeah. too. As a matter of fact, this is, this is where the conversation gets very entertaining and fun to kind yeah, of spend. Like, oh, these are all the different things. You know? These, I'm, ju I'm just saying, you could suppose yeah. a lot of stuff, but some of the stuff that you might suppose seems a lot more credible than mm -hmm. what we're handed by mainstream academia because either true. they give us some cockamamie story that's purely theoretical or they just throw up their hands and say we don't know there's yeah. no proof there's no evidence and no nothing so anybody can suppose anything so while we're supposing i figure i do some supposing too <laughs> but um in but any I case you know I, that's interesting to say i don't know a lot of and, interesting and, things you could suppose yeah, on not, with all of this stuff but exactly. it would be interesting to see the end result of your research into this because that's going to tell us a lot see that's going to, when you compile all this something into one tome, you know, one book, you know, then we're going to see, because we're going to be able to compare, do comparisons right there in that book. I'm not going to have to run around the library and go, okay, so let me get this book about the uh, Micronesia, and I'll get this book about the Philippines, and I'll get this book about India, and I'll read all this stuff. You know, that's going to kill me. <laughs> So I'm going to be looking forward to reading a book like yours because I'm going to have all that information in one spot, you know, and that's going to be very helpful into 
trying to draw some conclusions, you know, from. Yeah. Well, you'll get, you'll get like, uh, usually when I do a book, I do it in a series. Um, like, uh, let me see here. Here's, here's my two marketing books that yeah. I just recently published. They come in a series. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you, so when I finally yeah. get to the research, you'll, you'll get find one for out. Asia, I mean, you'll get one for Europe, you get one for North America, for South America, for Africa, for, you know. And when you, you have your, your, your giant file cabinet filled yeah. with and stuff, you can have and your virtual series. file cabinet <laughs> filled with stuff, you're going to have to figure out of how you're going to approach it and how many <laughs> books you're going to be able to put this in because you don't, like you said, you don't oh, know goodness. how far down the rabbit hole you can go with some of these things. But just getting the basic mythologies from some uh, of these yeah. indigenous people. Yeah. My, we got to my... hear that first. We got to, yes. that's the first thing we got to hear. Right? You know, otherwise, we, we could just suppose story. into a, infinity over here. But I'm interested in hearing all these things because it's directly related to the research that I do. I haven't moved out of North America yet, but I'm it's going so to North America by itself. Yeah, I'm, exactly. And I mean, it's I mean, I've already done 20 or 30 videos so far, each a half hour a piece. And I've got to do the rest of the states and then I'm going to start working on international giants international. So I'll be doing the accounts of the international accounts after that but you can right. see i mean it's not something you can talk about in five minutes with somebody you know just you know people say hey can you tell me about what you're doing in about five minutes and the answer is no i just can't it's impossible you know watch some of my videos or whatever it is it's impossible to put together in just yeah. You, know, you know, so many words, a 600 word oh. essay or something like that. Oh, it's very yeah. difficult to put together. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the end product here. And you say it's going to take you two years, but I bet you it takes you longer. But, but oh, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm hoping two years because, you know, I'm not a young guy, but, you know, but um, I'm <laughs> hoping that I'm years hoping years to put that. together in two years. Yeah. But um, there's a lot. Because remember, come. remember, Dave, I'm not doing, um, I'm not doing any of the scientific stuff like right. we were doing. Or any just of the, doing the account, the mythology, the mythological I'm, story. Yes. Right. Which so is going to be enough. Bible stories. It's going to be enough. Yeah. And, and that's it. So yeah. my little contribution to the, 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 how deep the rabbit hole goes for how. Maybe that's for a later book. Yeah, or something like yeah, that. You know, maybe after you figure everything out from your research, maybe. you'll you'll go one step further and start supposing in another oh book goodness. or whatever. I spent last four. Um, I'm actually finishing up a book. Um, it ended up being it's going to be a three part book series, volume book one, two, and three. Um, and in my other YouTube videos to kind of start going into the interviews about it. But um, I spent forty years studying the ascension of Earth into 5d based on buddhist awakening ceremonies right that's I your other book years. right that's your, yeah that's and the awakening that's, book that's my awakening ascension books and i'm putting those together right now 40 years of research i'm finally putting it all my my writing together right. and i'm gonna hopefully finish that by the summer uh because i'm just basically revising old material that i old blogs i've been writing um over a decade ago and i'm revising it and, and making current and finally have the time um to do it because now i had my children my children are a little bit grown you know all that kind of stuff yeah. but um but when i'm done but I'm, i i love talking to the different elders of these different tribes and getting their story and just recording the story and sure. taking that following it away going to the next island talking to different elders following it away and so then when i go through all the stories and collect all the stories from different tribes and elders all along pacific and asia as far as i can find when I'm done, then I will hold the research out and organize it into a book. And maybe it's a couple books in Asia. I have no, I have right. no clue how, how thick right. this. Don't project is. too much. Yeah, to Don't project too much. Yeah, Keep it I'm in not. Day, I'm just so. going to let it be what it turns out to be. Your journey yeah. begins here. So, it, you yeah. know, you're just. Yeah. And you're then just I'm going to go to the different continents. Right. <laughs> so. Um, it may, it, it may end up, you know, you know, I try to do, I try to write in tech, 
a lot of integrity and try to have try to be accurate and integrous. Not, I don't have any publisher give me a timeline. I need something right now. Put slap something together. That's a piece that's of good. Of that's I don't really good. have anybody who's going to cut my words deep and say, like, "Oh, you can't say that." That's going to that's going to challenge the mainstream, you know, religion or challenge the mainstream science. I don't got any Major of those kind of roadblocks. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, I'm just a working mom who likes this stuff and you know, just writes and gets residual from my books. And this is the stuff that I find interesting that I well, don't Well, I think you got a big hit on your hand, to be Aww, honest with you. Yeah. I know, I really do. I think this is something that people are going to be highly interested in, even more so now than ever before. So I think you're, you're, you're in the sweet spot with this because people want to know. I know all the people on no. my channel do and my buddy's channels, I mean, my friend CF Apps has like 200,000 subscribers, I mean, who are into this kind of stuff. So, oh, hook me up with him, Dave. Yeah, I want to be on his show. I can Maybe. hook you up with him. I can hook you up with him. <laughs> I, I mean, I can try, but that we're good <laughs> friends. We're good to. friends, so I mean, he may be interested in that. I'm surprised you haven't solicited because his title of his channel is just his name there, CF Apps, but and nobody knows about it. But I'm good friends with the guy. I'm good friends with a lot of guys, and so um, I'll, I'm, I'll spread the word around. I can talk yeah. to Chuck about it because he's really, got I'm that's really, big exposure, big exposure. Thank you, thank you. You know what? Um, like you know, when I'm putting this book together, as I am asking for book help from your audience and other people's audience to, you know, send me your leads. Even if you don't send me an email, just put a comment in your sure. videos comment field of, hey, check out this tribe and so-and-so. I just need the lead. I just need the name of the tribes so that I can snuff it all out. You, because I don't want to, I don't want to like, for example, go through Australia and gather as much folklore around these megaliths as possible and then miss a small tribe that I completely missed through my research. It may have a piece of information that could be critical. You know, so I'm trying to do a thorough job um, and your audience, everybody else who's sending those leads are helping put this book together. So they are all, it's almost like a crowd, crowdsourced. Crowd, I don't want crowd your money. Crowdsourced, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want your money. I just yeah, want Yeah. You want your info. You want the info. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know what? I mean, I almost it's think. The maybe... audience is helping me put this book together. And so they will read their contribution this is one of this is one of the ways of of getting that is is you know it's a great way of networking as i say you know this is this is a sort of e-commerce method of <laughs> it is but, uh, in yeah, a way is. it is i mean you're you know you're soliciting you have something you want from people and what you're offering is you know the final product which is going to be you know, this book that you're putting together. So in a way, it's almost like e-commerce in a way. So, but you know, yeah. at least the word is getting out on my channel. I only have a oh, little yeah. bit more than a thousand subscribers, but you know, there is many of them have their own channels as well. So. Yeah. You know, I'm actually talking to a, um, he, he was an alt researcher, but he's doing his PhD now. Um, Max is a Russian uh, researcher in pyramids and he, so he has a website that he's, I've been following for the last decade and it's called pure world pyramids.com. Right. And his, much like you, Dave, he is, he was an ultra researcher who just loved the folklores of Atlantis and from the folklores of Atlantis that he grew up um, learning about Atlantis and Lemuria, he started following other pyramids besides Giza and he's been doing it for his whole life now he's doing a PhD and he has gone to the pyramids of Giza and taken a look at some of the materials in his studies yeah but um you know he's being a busy guy he um he I'm, I'm also going to be talking to him about his research and getting leads for him and what he says to me again is it starts with the folklores Vaughn it all starts with the folklores yeah so if yeah. you can just do a good job and tone the folklore is don't sugarcoat it. Don't cut anything out because it's not going to fit somebody's paradigm. Just tell it how it is. Somebody right. in the future who's interested in stuff will take that material and, you know, start looking for it. Yep. And before you know it, we'll have the 
the city of Troy was discovered. We'll have other things that are discovered. Absolutely. Um, you know, even with Sally. I firmly believe now, in it. I believe in it right. because I have even friends. Even with images now, kids are looking at satellite images going, oh, here's a pyramid here and here's this and this. Yeah. But when we have image, when we have technology where people can look and do, um, you know, sonar or yeah, they can look at the ground penetrating radar, ground penetrating they can radar, look into the LIDAR, ocean, these they can things look into the are ocean and see the there's a pyramid in that part of the ocean, and there's one in that part of the ocean, and they can see. Now, the interesting thing about the pyramids and the monolithic like structures like Stonehenge and other places in my other book research on the ascension of Earth. What they found with ley line research sure. is like when you do dowsing rods for ley lines. Magnetic and, and, lines, the magnetic, magnetic lines, lines of the earth. Magnetic lines. There's access points of the earth that have high energy. And um, when and they do this now when they're trying to locate where they can build a power plant or right. a, a light plant. All yeah. cities do this when they're trying to build a new power plant or they're trying to put their the city of light plant for everybody's lighting, whatever. They use dowsing rods and they try to locate the where energy, the energy yeah. lines are. And that's where they build the power plants, the water plants, all these stuff, because it, it, they're getting the energy from the Earth's access point. And people thousands and thousands of years ago knew where those lines were. They were doing the same thing. Now, here's what was interesting with that. These pyramids and megaliths are on those access points as well. Yes. Yes. There's some research well, yeah. been done on it. I've seen some yeah. of it. On so YouTube. it's not just... No, it's know, not crazy you thought. or crazy me or whatever. It's a okay. real thing. And they, megalith and megalithomania has covered quite a few of these things. They have quite a few researchers there. Of course, in mm -hmm. England, they're always messing around with dowsing rods and all that kind of stuff. Sure, it's and, great and, exercise. Yeah, they're cool people, the English. The British it's are cool exercise. people. Go, go and, for a walk. And, and they've also found that most likely Stonehenge is some sort of astronomical clock or something like that. You know, it's been researched on with that because of the concentric rings, the way that the the megalithic stone is placed and what it could be, some of the calendar or a clock or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of research into these things and ley lines, energy lines, magnetic earth lines are all part of this. And again, harking back to whatever previous technology, they, the previous civilizations in the past, and I often tell my subs this, they used electricity and magnetism and sound and light. They used it for, to accomplish the same goals as we use it, but they used it in different ways. It's not the same technology, and hence that's why everybody jumps immediately to the alien thing because that seems to make sense in their head, you know, some other kind of weird technology. But that's not true. The people on this planet who evolved here, grew up from here, sprang out of the soil here, or whatever, there could have been 10 advanced societies. The planet's so old. Mm -hmm. For all we know, there were 10 advanced societies just like ours at the same level, but they employed the technology to use these things. It was different. It would almost seem as science fiction to us, what they were doing with it. They were using the same things, electricity, magnetism, et cetera, et cetera, but they were using it with different types of technologies that's so bizarre and alien to us we can only imagine what they they might have been so that's you know that's why everybody falls into this alien thing so fast but no just the beings that live right here on this planet we are far more those things created yeah. those things they, they, we yeah. didn't have to get angels or nephilim or any of these kind of things anunnaki we, we didn't have we didn't need any of that stuff we had the people right here doing all that stuff and mm -hmm millennia and eons before any of this who knows i mean according to the indian mythology civilization goes back millions of years 
people go back yeah. millions of years in Indian yeah. mythology. Yeah, the stories, so the there could have been dozens and dozens and dozens. And that's what Randall Carlson often talks about with the catastrophes. We get up to a certain level, the catastrophe comes along and reduces us to cavemen again. But we're cavemen, but we're kind of smart cavemen because we take some of this stuff from the past with us. Maybe not all the engineers survive, just average people survive. They're reduced to cavemen, but they're using whatever smarts they have from the era they lived in to create all of these things. They have a base point, a starting point of some knowledge right. left over from the past, right. whether it right. through, be through folk tales or mythologies or stories that are told, tribal stories that are told again, and just instruction, how to do this, how to do that, you know, that's carried down and carried down. They have came from a culture so more advanced than ours, we could only speculate on what that might be. So anyway, let's let's yeah. wrap this up because we yeah. got, I don't think our <laughs> readers will be falling asleep by the end of this, but but no, I hope not. Like I mean, not. I hope they're I hope they're paying attention here or whatever. But we went a long time already, so let's um, um let's maybe wrap it up and then um, you know you'll come back with me in a future day when you have maybe something to add. We'll get you back on just to you know get people yeah I would love you know, to do a check interested in, like, again. You know, you got to make the rounds again. It's like sending <laughs> postcards around at Christmas. You know. <laughs> You want to make sure the people that, you know, you do business with and everything that, you know, that you're thinking about them, you know, but whatever, I'm just saying, you know, just to reinforce the idea that you do need this help and anybody else could help you out with, uh, you know, um, conveying these uh, mythologies or folklores or whatever from their own families or what they've heard mm -hmm. or whatever it is, that's going to be extremely helpful for you. Right. You know? Right, and you know, I wanted to dispel one folklore or one myth about authors. A lot of people think that authors are, are you know, just kind of on gravy train and their books sell like hotcakes on the New York Times. Okay, that's like maybe 0.01% and they have a publisher that tells them what to do <laughs> Yeah, and, and so forth. Most authors are like me. Most authors are, are normal working people Right. who do this because this is their art this is right. their meditation this is their love right. so um you know that's that's one mythology I oh you could name mythology. a lot of authors from the past who never made a nickel but are some of the most famous authors that you can imagine and frank yeah and frank um a lot of the jane Eyre. yeah he, you know she wrote lots of stuff and um didn't take it didn't take. You know, people weren't reading that, you know, they, they want other stuff or whatever. It's often the case of, yes, I know. And there are many people who write even just short stories for, you know, Reader's Digest or whatever. I mean, whatever periodicals, they're just average working people too. They're just yeah. writing on the side. They have some skills. They write on the side and make a couple of bucks here and there or whatever, yeah. but yeah. they ain't getting rich on it like some people. But I mean, so if you want to write about the most fantastic and unbelievable and unsubstantiated stuff, you could make a million dollars, but that's all a loaded junk. You know, I just, you know, it's like dime store novels or something like that, but it's in the alternative research vein. It, yeah. they, they are entertaining. Um, I will say, I mean, like, you know, I'm really looking forward to when I get to the part where I'm, I'm, I'm work doing the research. I will come to you, Dave, for North America because definitely I'm really interested in North definitely. America as well. I'll, I'll, I'll know that. even more then. I think. Oh, I'm sure you will. I'll just talk if to my you. My <laughs> brain doesn't fry out by then, but um, hopefully not. But I mean, all my time is spent doing research and. Hey, you know, you know hey, I mean, that's but, my love. That's my passion. That's what I yeah. do. I don't watch TV. Put in, um, yeah. put in your um, put in your will. All my research. Please send a copy to Vaughn. <laughs> OK, that's fair enough. I don't have it going I anywhere else. Good. So uh, sure, you, know, you can have good. it and yeah. whatever else I, mean, I, I got just, too. I do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much for having me You're on your quite show. Quite welcome. It was very enjoyable. 
I do want to come back, uh, you know, and maybe give you some new research and new folklores. That yeah, let's I have check in on each other from time to time. Yeah. Say hello, <laughs> how's it going? You know, nice and friendly. You keep it friendly. Nice, we're friends now, I think. And, yeah, yeah. And we'll and, we'll just say, I'll you know, I'll just say, hey, Ron, what's up? And you'll let me know what you know, anything interesting that might be happening. And anytime you right, want to come right. on and talk about it again. Feel free to do that, you know. Yeah. So I, I would, I would love yeah, to have you as, on again. As we go down this rabbit hole and get more and more folklores and talk to more elders and tribes, leaders, you know, we can, you know, bring that information. I don't necessarily record it because a lot of a lot of the tribal elders and representatives, especially on the islands, yeah, um, have really bad Wi-Fi, and yeah. so um, you know, I can't do anything live, and so I will record it for myself, but then sure, just sure. document it, and then yeah. no, that's can, a good way to do it. Yeah, and then when we notes. connect, yeah, when we connect, I can kind of we'll do um, that too. Tell the story as well. So you guys will learn the stories as I gather the stories, and we will good. all have story time with Vaughn. Awesome! <laughs> I can't wait for it. Can't wait for All it, right. really. Two years is not coming soon enough for me, but <laughs> okay, well, we'll wait and we'll keep in touch while you're working on this thing to see what you're up to, you know, and maybe just to come on for a short video or something, you give us some, some some juicy cliffhangers or something like that, because <laughs> that's always good for business, you know. Sure, sure. All right? All, All right, right, Vaughn. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, uh, We'll be looking forward to your your future work. That's all. Thank you and, so and much. Come back and visit Thank again. you. Namaste. Yes. Bye-bye, Dee. God bless. Bye-bye <laughs> now. Thanks, Vaughn. Bye.